JP Morgan actually said it best. What did he say? He said, only gold is money. Everything else is credit. And so all of these products and they do it, they do it so invisibly because they know when they make these shifts, they, they really don't want you to understand what they're about, but yes, you know, in 1995, they created those sweep accounts that gave the banks the right and you kind of look at where we were inside of the monetary velocity inside the system in 95 they needed to create more leverage right so they uh, they legalized the fact that the banks could sweep your deposits into sub accounts in their names and then use your equity as collateral but that's true for stocks for bonds if they're held actually if you don't hold it you don't own it. In the complex world of finance, understanding the intricate dance between central banks, monetary policy, and global economic shifts is crucial. Lynette Zhang, an expert in financial markets, offers valuable insights into the current state of affairs and what it means for everyday individuals. In this video, we'll delve into Zhang's analysis, exploring key themes such as interest rates, inflation, the role of gold, and strategies for navigating uncertain times. Zhang begins by shedding light on the relationship between interest rates and the debt-based nature of our financial system. Contrary to popular belief, she explains that central banks don't lower interest rates because the economy is thriving, but rather to stimulate more borrowing. As we approach an election year, the debate over interest rate adjustments becomes increasingly pertinent. However, Zhang emphasizes that regardless of these decisions, the underlying issue of inflation remains. A critical aspect of Zhang's analysis is the concept of monetary velocity, the speed at which money changes hands within the economy. She notes a significant decline in monetary velocity since the late 1990s, a trend that could signal the onset of hyperinflation. Observing patterns and shifts in monetary velocity becomes essential for gauging the health of the economy and potential future developments. Before we begin, don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more expert insights and analysis. When they ease, when they lower the interest rates, it's not because things are great. It's because they need more debt in the system since it's a debt-based system. And um, it's an election year. You know, I can't sit here and tell you whether they're gonna ease or not ease, but what I can tell you, it's not gonna matter what they do that this inflation that they call sticky is because they're out of tools, right? You raise the rates like they've done and you break the economy and there are a lot of delinquencies spiking and the economy is definitely breaking no matter how much they talk about it. And they talk about tightening, right? They raise the rates, the rates so that's supposed to tighten. But if you look at the um, from the Federal Reserve, and I can't remember what it's called right now, but it's the uh, monetary conditions, I think. And they they never really got hard except for the spike in 2020 for a minute, for, for just a heartbeat. So the conditions when they're sitting here shocked that the economy is being so resilient and consumers that have taken on even more debt that they can handle for sure. Um, so resilient, you know, it's, it's really a joke. And, and like I said earlier, I've been watching the monetary velocity. That's the number for viewers that aren't familiar with it. The number of times that money changes hands and it's an indication of how stimulated the economy is. And since what i think 97 1997 it's been going down i mean dropping very precipitously it, with an occasional bump up so i've been watching that to to indicate when we are entering the beginning of hyperinflation when money changes hands very quickly cuz that's what happens in, 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 in hyperinflation. You get this fiat money, this government money in, and you want to get rid of it as quickly as possible. And so that speeds up and up and up. And uh, if you look at that chart, the M2 velocity at, at the Federal Reserve's website, FRED, F-R-E-D, you know, you'll see that it is spiked up in a very pervasive way. So that means that the money is changing hands very quickly and that 
I could be dead wrong, but in my opinion, especially when you're looking at this major pattern shift, those major pattern shifts mean something. Whether you understand exactly what they mean or not, it means that something significant has shifted inside of the system and you need to be very, very weary. So, you know, I know that Wall Street hangs on kind of because they're definitely fighting the Fed these days, which is another big problem that creates, I, I mean, <laughs> Rob, there's so many disconnects uh, between the markets and the central bank and the Federal Reserve, but also between central banks globally and central banks, right? Where they used to walk in lockstep, raising rates the same, dropping rates the same, doing all the same monetary policy. That's not happening anymore either. So I'm seeing like a lot of decouplings and shifts and pattern shifts that are huge, huge pattern shifts, <laughs> huge. It is the speed at which those dollars are changing hands. So we've been watching this for a while. I mean, uh, truthfully, these things don't happen overnight until they happen overnight. So this shift away from the dollar has really been going on since 99 when they instituted the euro, where they thought that would take over as the world reserve currency. You know, so yes, these, these shifts, what was it? Hemingway, when asked how he went bankrupt, what did he say? Slowly at first and then fast. And that's what we're seeing here. And there's definitely a shift away from the dollar. There's a shift for the, for the SWIFT to become relevant again. But but there's something else that um, in a re very recent Bank for International Settlements report on the move toward the CBDCs is that the U.S. and this kind of this surprised me. I'm going to tell you, I missed this one, um, but that the U.S. is falling behind its more its other peers like the ECB and China's PBOC, et cetera. Um, I think even India, uh, there were at Switzerland. I mean, there are amongst a bunch of developed nations, uh, ev um, advanced economies and where's the fed in this and where's the dollar in these tests at the bank for international settlements. And they're, they're saying the dollar's falling behind. What does that tell us? What, what does that, where, where's the Fed in all of this? Where's the dollar in all of this? What is that telling us, those of us that live in America? Because I'm sure you have a global audience, right? <clears throat> it tells me that we are absolutely losing that position. We have been slowly at first. And this is something that could happen very rapidly because to your point, Rob, they are building the plumbing underneath the global financial system different than the SWIFT system, different than the U.S. money market based systems. And once that system is built, boom, they turn it on. We're done just that fast, just that fast. JP Morgan actually said it best. What did he say? He said, only gold is money. Everything else is credit. And so all of these products and they do it, they do it so invisibly because they know when they make these shifts, they, they really don't want you to understand what they're about. But yes, you know, in 1995, they created those sweep accounts that gave the banks the right. And you kind of look at where we were inside of the monetary velocity inside the system in 95, they needed to create more leverage, right? So they, uh, they legalized the fact that the banks could sweep your deposits into sub accounts in their names and then use your equity as collateral. But that's true for stocks, for bonds. If they're held, actually, if you don't hold it, you don't own it. Zhang highlights the growing disconnect between financial markets and central banks, as well as the fragmentation of global monetary policy. She discusses the decline of the US dollar's dominance and the rise of alternatives such as the euro and China's renminbi. Moreover, she draws attention to the Bank for International Settlements report, which suggests that the US is falling behind in the development of central bank digital currencies CBDCS, raising concerns about the dollar's future role. Drawing from historical wisdom, Zhang advocates for gold as a hedge against economic uncertainty. She echoes JP Morgan's assertion that only gold is money, everything else is credit, 
emphasizing the intrinsic value of this precious metal. Zhang's strategy involves leveraging gold to offset fixed-rate debt, thereby protecting against the erosion of purchasing power caused by inflation. What can I say? Because everything else is counterparty risk. Everything else is a contract. And you didn't read those contracts. You didn't write those contracts. So whose best interest are they going to be written for? It's not your money. The, the, you know, I mean, what is it? It's Well, I can't read this because it's in Vietnamese. But basically, you know, the money is, is a debt instrument that's owned by the Federal Reserve that does not, at this moment anyway, charge interest or pay interest, right? So, right, it, it is a perception and they have a team, a formal, the government has a formal team of perception management because if they can manage how you perceive things, then they can manage or they have a much better shot at managing how you move forward. I'm saying take the blinders off, read their own words. Don't take my word for it. Don't take Rob's word. Don't take any, don't take their word for it because they don't have your best interest at heart. Their job is to legalize the theft Right. And to to have this wealth transfer happen so invisibly that you don't complain. I mean, I mean, what is their definition? Central bank's definition of price stability. It's not that the price of an apple stays the same over time. You and I would think, oh, well, price stability, the price stays the same. No, no, no. It's that the price goes up at a slow enough increment that you don't notice and you don't ask for more money from your boss and and you continue on with your lifestyle like we've seen taking on debt to just maintain a standard of living when the reality is is this is a game and the the chips are stacked against us pie flipping design because they knew that people don't understand inflation but when, when Powell and Christine Lagarde came out and said, well, we don't really understand inflation. I mean, since they're the ones that, dri that are driving the inflation bus, don't you think that's a little scary? In the face of economic turbulence, Zhang offers practical advice for individuals seeking financial resilience. She advises against accumulating excessive debt and instead advocates for strategic investments in tangible assets like gold and silver. Moreover, she underscores the importance of self-sufficiency urging viewers to prepare for potential disruptions in the banking system by securing essential resources such as food, water, and energy. The government's plan for fixed rate debt is to repay that debt with dollars that have no value, right? Or less and less value over time and ultimately no value. Well, the strategy that I developed is actually based on that government strategy. So if you have credit card debt and you can somehow move it into some kind of fixed rate debt and then balance out your portfolio with severely undervalued gold. When they do those overnight resets and they take something that has no value and they revalue it against something that's all value, then gold will start to move toward its true fundamental value. But I'm not going to wait. I'm not looking for a top. So when they do that first revaluation personally, and I will tell people that are watching me when I'm doing this for myself, I will liquidate however much gold I need to, to bam, pay that debt off. So if you want to get out of debt and you've got credit card debt, and then don't use those credit cards more than what you can pay off on any given day, but also why not vote with some level of cash as well? Because cash is your very first line of defense. So, but not in the banks, because what do you do if the banks close or the banks limit you to, you know, 40 bucks a day or 200 bucks a day or however they're, they're going to limit you. So, you know, what do people do? You look at what you need to be as self-sufficient and independent as possible. And again, you start to plug those holes. If you don't have gold and silver, start to accumulate gold and silver. But you, you, you also need to 
make sure that you can get that food and that water and, and that energy. There are, no matter where you are, there are ways for you to accomplish those top three things you want your refrigerator to keep running. So you can do like a small, um, either a small solar system, which is the best because then it, that's re renewable. Um, but, but that's what, that's what you have to do, you know, and as far as getting out of debt, you got to move it to fixed rate, not add to it, not add to it, but buy the right amount of gold that you need so that when they do that reset, we don't know what that coverage is going to be, but in Venezuela, it went up like 3,500% overnight or something like that. And we just saw 50% devaluation in Argentina, right? So when that happens, you take advantage of it and you pay that full, that fixed rate debt off, but get that. I mean, I I'd say at this point, critical, get that moved over into fixed rate debt and then balance out your portfolio with gold with the intention of paying that debt off when it, the first reset, don't look for a top, just that first reset happens, get it done, get it done because everything is a contract and everything is in jeopardy.